The following program is a high-definition production of Blue Ridge PBS. Two hundred year old houses aren't that unique in Virginia. What makes this one special is this is the only house that is owned by the people of Virginia. This is a home where 54 families, governors and first families have lived. I don't know of any other home where that many families would have moved in and out of. This is, is a sensational place to house the first family of Virginia. It's not ostentatious, but it's very comfortable. We have a really fine house, and it's very Virginian. It's very dignified, but not pretentious. It's very elegant without being showy. I've always loved the front of the house, the porch and the fountain out front, and I tend to focus on the steps. As a writer who makes his living making things up, uh, my imagination runs wild and when I think about the feet that have trodden on those steps, and when I come up to those steps each time, in my mind's eye, I see people walking up and down those steps who had great historical significance um, during the course of American history, and uh, that sort of gives me chills. Coming in for that first time after the inauguration, after the parade, and coming in with my family and my kids, it really was, a, it was an extraordinary feeling. I literally carried my wife over the threshold, uh, so to speak, of the mansion. We had turned and waved and we were just about to walk in, and he reached down and he picked me up and I just went, oh! And I think that, that image and that memory will be frozen in my mind forever. When I thought about all of the history of this house, some of the founders of the uh, American Republic that have walked through here, Lafayette who's been in here, a number of other events uh, of great fame that have happened here. The governor's office itself was here for a hundred years where so many things that were important to the, in the history of the Commonwealth were here, survived the Civil War when a lot of Richmond was burned. And I thought, wow, I, I actually get to live in this place of history for, uh, for the next four years. It was, a, it was really immensely humbling and and happy experience for me and my family. In 1779, Virginia's second governor, Thomas Jefferson, wrote the order to move Virginia's capital from Williamsburg to Richmond. Housing was arranged for governors in the new capital city, but the home was in bad repair and less than stellar. The temporary housing stretched for more than 30 years. Previous proposals for a new house had gone nowhere but Governor John Tyler Sr. had an ace up his sleeve. Near the end of his term, he found a way to pay for it. Vacant land in the vicinity of Capitol Square, owned by the Commonwealth, was to be sold and the proceeds used to build a new mansion. In early 1811, James Monroe, who would later become President of the United States, signed the bill authorizing construction of the new executive residence. The old house was torn down and sold for $530, presumably for its wood. $20,000 was allotted for construction, including dependencies and landscaping. It was designed by a architect builder from Maine named Alexander Paris. He was schooled in the federal style, the new federal style, which is roughly a takeoff on the Adamesque style, the very light neoclassical style that was popular in England in the late 18th century. It was a very, very simple building, a very modest building. Uh, in fact, there was a move to replace it in the early 20th century because it was so modest. And the best way, I think, to think of this building is it's the antithesis of the governor's palace in Williamsburg. The house was completed in less than two years and came in under budget. Final costs were tabulated in March of 1813, just before Governor Barber and his family moved in. The price tag, $18,871. The early documents, including the legislation, refers to it as being a place of honor and dignity, and I always think of, of those words because I think that uh, the design by Paris and the way in which the mansion continues to be used are a realization of, of those early words. There's certainly a pride in this as Virginia's first house. It is the oldest executive mansion that continues to serve in that purpose, and it was purpose built as an executive mansion. It is a private residence. It is a, a place of business. It is an office for the governor. And it's constantly in use for, for social events. 
and for educational events and for open for tours. There is no other house that has this broad a purpose. The mansion, called the Government House in the early years, has not only been through a lot of families and seen a lot of history over its 200-year existence, the building itself has undergone a lot of changes. That's one of the inter interesting things about the life of this building is that it's, it's never gone out of use and its evolution has never stopped. It's always reflected the lives of the people who've dwelled within it and worked within it. It was all lit by candles. The plumbing, outdoor plumbing, the necessary was outside, the kitchen was outside, and those are all growing things that the mansion had to go through, the different periods when um, it went from candle to gas to electric. It was uncomfortable by our standards, but no one then knew any different, and so it was actually uh, sort of the upper, the upper experience. The alterations made in the 1840s to the mansion by Governor William Smith would have shocked his predecessors, who were more concerned with replacing worn rugs and broken windows. He installed uh, the first modern conveniences, if you will, a primitive toilet and a shower bath in the basement. And this sort of toilet was um, just a most, pretty much an indoor privy. And the waste from the kitchen and the toilet would go down an open trench along the road, Governor's Road down to empty in the canal. Innovations on the house continued with the next governor. Governor Floyd was the one who installed gas lighting and that was cheaper than candles and so it was an improvement over the, the quantity of light. But gas was dangerous, it was uh, smelly and it could cause explosions. So this was quite a daring uh, innovation. It did allow the governor to have more evening entertainments. It made, made for a more pleasant evening you could stay up longer and read at, at night and they were both great readers. The 1860s brought the Civil War. Richmond served as the national capital for the Confederate States of America as well as the state capital of Virginia. Governor William Smith was our governor and his wife's name was Elizabeth. They were here right before the fall of Richmond. Governor Smith buried Confederate money in bonds and loaded 60 boxes of important papers into steamboats, then left for Danville. Elizabeth and her daughter stayed behind to secure the house and pack up Virginia's silver for safekeeping. She heard that the, all the Confederate soldiers were clogging all the roads, and she thought, well, we'll stay the night and leave before dawn. We'll slip out early before dawn, before, you know, everything gets chaotic again. Well, that decision almost cost her and her daughter her life because by morning the retreating Confederate soldiers started torching the military supplies and by morning though there were explosions and fires were raging through the city and a lot of the embers were falling on the mansion. It was only because of a, a group of the diligence of our Richmond citizens that circled the mansion and to save it, and they, they made a bucket brigade and passed water to the roof, and they just kept dousing the roof to try to keep the fires out. Otherwise, we would have lost the mansion. 50 years after the war, in 1915, a Confederate soldiers' reunion was held in Richmond. Governor Henry Stewart, nephew of Jeb Stewart, hosted a gala reception for the occasion at the mansion. In the 1880s, against the backdrop of the Gilded Age, the governor's house looked plain and old-fashioned. Virginia's governors ignored the unadored exterior, concentrating on decorating the inside. There was no single Victorian style for household furnishings. No surface was left unembellished, no fabric tolerated unless patterned. Bare space was a problem, looking for a solution. In addition to the clutter, the era also brought light to the house. Governor Fitzhugh Lee was the one who brought electricity to the mansion and what they called a speaking telegraph, which was of course a telephone. The electricity was very new. It was only about seven or eight years after Thomas Edison demonstrated his light bulb. And it was chancy, it was dangerous. A lot of people wouldn't have that kind of thing in their home, but this was even before the White House had electricity. There were no wall sockets at that time. And so what you'd have would be there would be an electrical wire coming down from the ceiling and it would go to a lamp on the table or, or across the room. So there were wires hanging everywhere, which looks terrible to us, but 
Until the wall socket was invented, so they would have to just nail wires around the edge of the room. Up until this point in its history, the governor's mansion had largely been a work of men, but that was about to change. Governor Andrew Jackson Montague and his wife Elizabeth were frequent visitors to the White House during President Theodore Roosevelt's administration and had seen firsthand the improvements made there. Betsy Montague wanted to redecorate the house in the colonial revival style, which is what the White House had, an old Victorian mishmash was, was out of favor. Um, but she didn't have the money for that. So she uh, came up with a scheme where she wrote her own spending proposal and planned to deliver it herself in person to the finance committee uh, when it next met. No woman had ever done that before, certainly no governor's wife. So it was quite nervy of her, very bold. She um, had a little luck. A few days before the finance committee was to meet, there was a reception at the mansion, and the finance committee chairman, she described later as being a very large man. Well, he sat down on one of the um, rickety chairs, and it crashed to the floor. So when Betsy Montague showed up at the finance committee a few days later, she rem remembers that she was met with great sympathy and they voted $7,500, which let her redecorate the house in the Colonial Revival style. The First Ladies do an awful lot that goes unnoticed, and so we've had a marvelous project in honor of the 200th anniversary to have all of the living First Ladies have their portraits painted in their inaugural gowns by a Virginia woman artist, and we had a big celebration last year with eight out of the 10 living First Ladies coming here with several of the governors to uh, celebrate the unveiling of the portraits. It was a special moment. Governor Albertus Harrison once said, every decent mansion has a ghost. The executive mansion is no exception. Over the past hundred years or so, residents, employees, and visitors have heard or sensed the ghost. We knew the ghost was there and we enjoyed the presence of the ghost. I was asleep one night in what they call the governor's bedroom when she turned some pictures over in the middle of the night and made a loud noise that I thought was something coming from the children's room, so I got up and went and checked on that. But when I came back, the pictures, which had been leaning up against the wall, uh, had been turned over a more than a 90-degree turn, so somebody had picked them up and turned them over this way. Uh, onto the floor to make that loud clattering noise. That ghost did that to tease me. ABC correspondent Ann Compton had her encounter with the ghost during Hurricane Agnes in 1972. A lot of that rain came down the James River and threatened the very center of the capital city, Richmond. When the power was completely out, Governor Holton's secretary, Felicia Prendergast, came and got me and took me over to the mansion where there are two staircases from the main hall upstairs. The light over the ladies' staircase was on and power was out throughout the city. The ghost of the Virginia governor's mansion. I saw the light on myself. And how about butler and prankster Tootie Towns? Has he met her? <laughs> uh, me and her are friends. <laughs> so. She's kind of my partner in crime, <laughs> if you would say. I kind of get everybody here, so. She don't kind of mess with me, so I think we kind of, you know, gel together. I have not met her, I have not heard her. Now, uh, having said that, governors uh, try to, I think, perpetuate the legend in part by uh, playing tricks on the new governor. And so, Governor Kane uh, helped with that. And, he was very devious in what he did to me. He uh, left cell phones in places like closets and on top of the elevator. And uh, then they would call that at late at night and it would have an automatic, uh, automatic ring that would sound like, uh, like a ghost. So that was his trick to me. It did freak us out for a little bit, I have to say, until uh, uh, my uh, Cracker Jack kids, uh, along with the maintenance staff here, sort of uncovered the trick and we found that it was just cell phones. So that's the closest we've come to the ghost. The early 20th century was a time of expansion. Virginia's population had more than doubled since Jefferson's capital had been constructed and government had grown accordingly. The Virginia legislature had added two wings to the capital. 
it was time for the first house to expand. The architect was a man named Duncan Lee. This was his first project. He was only 22 years old when uh, he was called upon to do this. And they did need more room here. It was, um, the standards of entertainment were <laughs> increasing. So they wanted a fine dining room. And because the space is so constricted here, they couldn't do a big wing on it. So he very carefully designed an octagonal wing or with clipped corners with an oval room inside it, creating this dining room. It's a lovely room behind us. And uh, at one point there was a very large mantelpiece that was dead on axis. So you would look through the archway and see that mantelpiece. It just as you would stand at the mantelpiece and look through the front doors, you would see the George Washington sculpture. I mean, it really created this terrific axis through the building, which again was was one of the things that Colonial Revival was all about, the creation of these sort of long views and axes. And that meant that the old dining room, which was one of those rooms on the back of the original plan, didn't have to be there anymore. So those two rooms were combined into the one big room that we have now, the ballroom, which makes a very grand space reception room for, for entertaining. Over the next several years, more changes and additions were made. In 1926, just before the keys were to pass to a new governor, little Billy Trinkle created some changes of his own. Little Billy was my uncle who we called Big Billy because he had a son named Little Billy. Someone handed a sparkler to Little Billy who was almost five um, on a few days after Christmas and he got too close to the tree. You know what happens to a Christmas tree, a dry tree when it gets anywhere near a flame and it exploded into flame. The butler rushed in, tried to put it out, couldn't. The fire spread so fast. Fortunately, everyone got out very quickly except Lee. My grandmother had gotten out of the mansion, been evacuated, and realized that her oldest son was upstairs asleep. And she ran back in. They fought her, tried to keep her from going back in, but she got in and ran up the steps, and then she became trapped. Found my uncle asleep, woke him up, got him to jump out the window into the arms of Clayton Setgray, the butler, uh, and miraculously neither of them were, was hurt. It was three stories down at that point because it's in the back of the house. By that time the fire department had come. Well, they throw up a ladder, but it only goes up two stories. Fire Chief Captain Rust goes to the top of the ladder. She jumped, he caught her, managed to hang on to her ankle. Upside down, he's holding her. They throw up another ladder next to her, get her that way, and lower her to the ground. And it was at the end of my grandfather's term, and uh, she was in the hospital for months, and my grandfather moved into the room next door and finished his term living in the hospital next to her. So this is the ring that was on my grandmother's hand, Helen Ball Sexton Trinkle, when she ran back into the mansion during the fire. And this was left to her son, my dad, Jimmy, who left it to me. Little Billy was found later hiding under the smokehouse, and his first words were, I did it. He took a lot of grief, I think, <laughs> but he very good-natured. He was a wonderful man. The functional 50s style focused less on historical accuracy and more on upholstered comfort, simple lines, and minimal ornamentation. Outdoors, the wrought iron fence was replaced with a brick wall that could be more easily guarded. Each governor's wife did make a change and uh, added something that hadn't been there before, including the little stand where the policeman uh, stands at the entrance to the governor's mansion. And until one of the governor's wives came up with the idea of a little covered stand with a seat in it, those poor men just stood out there no matter what the weather was. Josephine Almond took pity on the guards. The Capitol Police stood outside all day, 24 hours a day, and she just felt very sorry for them. She wanted to have a guardhouse. Well, there was some resistance to this because it would ruin the look of the house or something, but she insisted. The battleship USS Virginia, built in the shipyards of Newport News, was launched in 1904. It was a tradition in those years for battleships to have a silver service to use when hosting guests or for ceremonial occasions. Nearly half a century after the ship's launch, the set of silver, which originally contained 52 pieces, would find its way back to the Commonwealth. 
When Governor and Ms. Almond were governor, they went to South Carolina, and that governor and first lady had South Carolina's battleship Silverware. Well. So they thought, well, when we go home, let's find out where is Virginia's battleship Silver. So they went to the Department of Navy, and they said, well, funny you would ask, it's out in San Diego. We're getting ready to ship it to the Marine Corps base in Quantico. So through a little bit of convincing, and I think some help from her husband as well, Governor Almond, they were able to get that silver service on loan to the mansion from the Navy. They had a $165 COD charge on it when they arrived at the mansion. And I understand that they had to scurry around to collect the $165 so that they could have the silver service left here at the mansion. And there's only one thing missing, and that's the key to the cigar box. And then back in 2004, the Navy decided they wanted it back. So fortunately, Governor Warner was adamant that was not going to happen, and he, under his administration, they were able to obtain it and get ownership rights to the silver service. So it is ours to keep. Traditionally, the governor's wife was expected to manage the mansion, its staff, and official entertainment by herself. In the 1970s, the General Assembly acknowledged that demands had grown beyond what one person could handle and authorized the hiring of an executive assistant for the First Lady. Governor Linwood Holton's administration would bring other changes as well. The day I was inaugurated, John Mitchell, uh, the Attorney General of the United States, was there as a representative of the president, President Nixon, to attend my inauguration. And his wife, uh, Martha, was with him. She went bouncing through the uh, mansion the day we went over there for lunch after the inauguration. And uh, in a loud, boisterous voice walking down between the parlors, well, Jinx, it's just beautiful, but where in the hell are the antiques? <laughs> but. Uh, Jinx was determined uh, to have it represent uh, the period or periods that existed since its creation. The um, Citizens Advisory Council was created in 1973 uh, by Mrs. Holton, uh, was the first lady at the time. In the beginning, uh, the first three people that were in charge of it, one of them was the head of Colonial Williamsburg, and one was the man who did the antiques for the uh, State Department and the White House and they would go to New York and see something they thought we should have, like a chandelier. So they would borrow it, have it brought down and hung here, and then they would tell me, have a party. And have a party meant somebody that comes to this party is going to contribute that, and they always did. <laughs> <laughs> you never had to send the chandelier back. Huh? Never had to send anything back. And I think that's also at the time where you start to see the building evolving into more of a museum, to more of, it was always open for public functions. It was always a very public building. But you start to see this, this move to treat it like a museum and to actually interpret it to people. And it's not just a place that you come for a reception, but this is a place that you would now come to, to learn about the Commonwealth, to learn about the governors, to learn about the building. The Giles cupboard, the mansion was very fortunate to get. It is one of the very few pieces that we actually have that belong to a former governor. Um, and this was acquired several years ago by the Citizens Advisory Council with Emil Jenkins, a late CAC member, who is the one who spearheaded that effort. There's a special little table in the governor's office that belonged to Patrick Henry. I love to point that out to people. It was received by Mrs. H.C.L. Wells and is from the 18th century. Um, and one of the neatest parts of that table is that if you look on the very bottom of it, there is a plaque that says, from Patrick Henry's plantation. Governor Byrd came into office in the late 1920s and realized that the state house did not have a piano, and this is because it was burned in the Trinkle Fire. So he petitioned the General Assembly for money, and much like today, they did not have the funds to pay for things like that. And so he said, fine, I will sell the state limo because I have my own automobile, and I will buy a piano with it. So 1920s, he bought that piano, which we still have today. It's played year round, tuned one a year and has real ivory keys on it. We love that. Our kids love to, to play the, the grand piano. And then, but there's a little old piano that's very, very vintage that's in the First Lady's parlor. That's a very special piece. 
This piano is not in working order like the bird piano, but it too is a very important piece because it is another piece that actually belonged to a former governor. Now we do know that the spinet piano in the ladies' parlor was not actually here when Governor Barber lived in the mansion. It belonged to him. It was at his plantation home in Barbersville, which is the home of Barbersville Vineyards currently, but certainly a great piece that we were able to acquire to represent our first resident. Surprisingly, the dwelling has very few objects that are tied directly with sitting governors. And so there's always um, a great interest in returning pieces that have clear provenance to sitting governors. Of course, as you can imagine, they, they don't show up very often. Uh, but those are at the, the, really at the top of the wish list to bring in pieces that, that help to more personally tell that story and to, to more closely connect this building with its, its previous inhabitants. Governor Charles Chuck Robb and his wife, Linda Bird Johnson Robb, began the tradition of inviting former governors and their families back to the mansion for a reunion. The custom continues today. It's wonderful coming here. It's always, it, it feels great to come here and we're always welcomed regardless of who's in the, in the mansion and, and it's, it's wonderful, wonderful to, to be here and to feel our, our history. I'm connected, fortunately, to James Barber, and uh, I'm a direct descendant. Uh, I don't know how many greats he is, but he's a great, 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 great grandfather. I feel like I belong here. But before I felt, uh, my father made a point of telling me, tell them you're a direct descendant of James Barber. And it was always awkward for me, but it paid off because I got to see his portrait and, you know, had a connection. Our mutual love for this house and getting to share that with all the other uh, inhabitants who've had the special opportunity to be here has been uh, a, a, a very wonderful thing and it is something that brings us together and that we can all find common ground on. It's really a unique experience that it makes the former governors and spouses and families sort of a, a, a unique club and we have that in common with each other and enjoy sharing that with each other and, and it's always nice to remember there are things we can come together on when there are so many things that folks differ on. And we, and we do gather at least once a year and sometimes more than that with the other governors and wives and uh, we just don't even have to have any working up to getting used to each other. We just jump right in together. We had about uh, three or four hundred people here, literally from all over the country. And some of them were related not just to one governor, but three or four governors. It was a lot of uh, fun, incredibly intriguing to see that many people that really knew the history of Virginia, knew not only what their own uh, ancestors had uh, had done for the state, but knew a lot about other governors' accomplishments over the years. It's really, really a very heartwarming and extraordinary event, and we look forward to keeping that going. During the administration of Governor Gerald Lee Valiles, the Citizens Advisory Council accomplished its first major exterior renovation, returning the facade to its 1830s appearance. When we were here during the, the late 80s, um, we renovated the outside of the mansion. We put the parapet back on top and the panels between the windows that had been bricked over years ago. They were originally part of the uh, design of the house. They show in the very earliest drawing we have of the house. And you see those panels there with decorative festoons and little rosettes in them. That was typical. You see this sort of thing in England. You see it on New England houses. and. Apparently by the 1880s after the Civil War they had seriously deteriorated and they were taken out. This time we didn't put them back in wood and composition, we put it back in cast stone so they wouldn't fall apart. And we made one little concession. Instead of the rosette in the middle of the swag, we put a dogwood blossom. That's our state flower, we thought that's an appropriate little subtle change that we could make there to make it a little more meaningful to, to this house. Went back to not the original color of the mansion, but the second color was the yellow that you now see, and we thought that was so much more attractive. The brick was originally painted, but painted red, and that was a normal treatment for buildings. It's called red watch, mixture of iron oxide, sometimes it had blood in it, linseed oil, all sorts of awful things to get the red color. It was kind of a primitive waterproofing technique and it was also a way of making ordinary brick look like the real fine press brick. It was like moving into a new house after they, they scraped down layers and layers and layers and found this, the yellow that it is today. And the yellow makes all the difference in the world. It really makes the house stand out.
Just before the start of the third millennium, the mansion underwent its most extensive renovation. The overarching goal was to return the historic portions of the structure to their 1830s appearance while making the entire complex safe, secure, modern, and accessible to the handicap. Governor James Gilmore III and his wife Roxanne played important roles as part of the team. The Gilmores deserve a great deal of credit for what they did in terms of refurbishing. It is and was rather an old building, 1813. Now, when you consider a building 200 years old, that's long enough for some people to say, are you still living in it? And so that's why it was important to re refurbish it and, re and do what it was done to, to bring it to its uh, present state. It was really obvious that the house needed a lot of attention. The systems were antiquated, heating and air conditioning, the kitchen was antiquated, bathroom facilities, all of that seriously needed upgrading. And at that same time, uh, a lot of cosmetic work was done on the inside to give the, the interior pretty much, particularly on this floor, the, the look that it has now. People were working, you know, day and night because uh, things could happen during the day, but then things had to happen at night that were not dust worthy and those kind of things. That was kind of your, one of the on point guys every day, you know, what was going on. Here's a you know, contract that had 40 questions every day, those, those kind of things. Kitchen was the biggest change. What it was before was a basic ordinary house kitchen. You had a stove, um, just like four little eyes on top of it, and we had counters in the middle. They came to me and said, Mark, put together your wish list. And I did, thinking that some of it, you know, when you get down to the end of it, some of it will, uh, get, will be crossed off. But, you know, they really came through with what we needed to produce the product that you should expect out of your governor's mansion. So I was quite pleased to see that it, you know, it, it came to fruition, not with any extravagance, but what it should be. One of the main things we did exterior was we removed all of the, uh, I would probably guess a hundred years worth of lead-based paint that was on the front of this mansion and on the portico columns, uh, the wood and everything was scraped back, uh, all the lead paint was removed and we went back almost to brick. Another project undertaken in the 1999 renovation was the cleaning of a 400-year-old portrait. It had been given to Virginia as a Christmas gift in 1926 by Nancy Langer Astor, the Danville girl who grew up to marry an English Viscount. Conservators were astonished to see that it had been painted over three or four times. The only part of the portrait that remained unchanged was the subject's face. One of the things that our book First House found was that the portrait of what we was said to be Queen Elizabeth I for many, many years is not actually the queen. Um, through some research, through a lot of research that the author of the book, Mary Theobald, did, she discovered some files at the library that determined that she was not the queen, but instead a lady of her court, a lady in waiting, primarily determined because of the crown. The crown on the portrait is not that of royal but that of somebody on the court. To commemorate the 1999 renovation, a plaque was placed at the gate to the mansion grounds to honor those who had helped bring the project to fruition. I hope to bring my kids here one day and show them my name on the plaque out front. So that's my contribution. But I've, I've always been very honored and very proud to have worked here. You know, my mother thinks it's a big deal, but that's always good. But uh, it, it's nice to know that well, when people come and, you know, a lot of people know who I am sometimes, and they say, oh, I didn't know your name was on there. And, they, you know, my sister didn't even know it till, uh, till just recently. So it's kind of nice to know that that's going to be there for, for a very long time, and uh, it makes me proud. My um, grandmother was a great gardener, and uh, she had great taste. She helped redecorate parts of the mansion, as I'm sure all the First Ladies did. But I think her particular contribution was the gardens. Governor and Ms. Stanley turned to prominent landscape architect Charles Gillette. His approach emphasized the symmetry of the space. Going beyond plantings, he added a brick privacy wall and connected the old kitchen to the house with a brick walkway and balcony. The work was finished in time for Garden Week in April 1956. Over the years, Gillette's garden design strayed. 
we were able to have the Garden Clubs of Virginia team up with us and we have partnered with them over the years and they funded the restoration back to the 1954 original plan to the greatest extent we could. Um, almost every plant was the exact cultivar or if it was a newer cultivar, it was just an improved of the same species. So the garden back there is pretty much the same as it would have looked 50 years ago as far as the design. Overlooking the Gillette Garden is a live oak tree planted in 1931 by famous aviator and explorer Admiral Richard Byrd. It survived Hurricane Isabel in 2003 and it is still thriving today. Also on the grounds is a vegetable and herb garden. The garden was one of the first things I um, brought to the mansion just because my maiden name is Gardener and my dad loved to garden and I, it just seemed appropriate. I felt the mansion should have a garden. I knew during different periods it had had a garden. It was a, a functional garden with everything from uh, tomatoes to spices to lettuce that is used down in the kitchen. Right along the edge of my garden, the next year I added wine grapes. And it, what really motivated me there was there's an old law that's on the book still. That goes back to 16 19, actually to the, the first, one of the first acts of the assembly, Act 12, where every um, settler over the age of 18 was directed to plant at least 10 wine vines. It, it was very tough for wine vines to grow in England, so they said the New World will supply wine to the crown. So we're about 400 years late, but we planted our 10 wine vines now. My grapes, my harvest, I am blending with vineyards across Virginia seven vineyards that all are um, serve on the Virginia Wine Board and making the first ever blend of red wine. It's going to be called 1813 for the Bicentennial. An untold number of distinguished people from all over America and all over the world have visited Virginia's governor's mansion. The first international celebrity to grace the mansion with his presence was the Marquis de Lafayette, almost 50 years after he fought for America's independence. He came to Richmond and it was his only stop in the South when he was here. And so they invited him over to spend the night, but naturally he had a pretty big entourage with him. So there wasn't room for them and they stayed in a hotel. He did, however, come up the steps and change his clothes in the bedroom on the third floor, which is now named the Lafayette Bedroom in his honor. Um, so he will forever have a place in the mansion. Throwing off British rule in 1776 did not mean Virginians turned their back on the British monarchy. Several members of the royal family have paid a visit to the mansion. King Edward VII came through on a tour. Um, he was actually sent to Virginia and the United States when he was the Prince of Wales by his mother, the Queen Victoria. He stopped in Richmond and they had a little luncheon for him here on a Sunday afternoon. Along with those royal visitors, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, stopped by and she was given a huge reception here, a nice elegant luncheon with the best Virginia food on our fine china and silver. And um, afterwards, the grandsons of the governor presented her with some mini furniture replicas of Governor Stanley's furniture factory. Our family was in the furniture business and uh, my father built miniature, perfectly built, uh, perfectly finished furniture for the princess uh, Anne and Margaret. And I'm only four years old, but you only meet the queen, you know, a very few times in life and it's pretty memorable. Uh, when that happens. Queen Elizabeth II came in 2007 when Governor Kane and First Lady Holton were here in office and she came to the mansion for a big reception. They gave her a tour of the mansion themselves and took her around Capitol Square before she addressed the General Assembly. She donated to us a Windsor chair that is one of a kind, um, one of the only kind out of that village in England that is in the United States of America and we proudly display it here in a bedroom in the mansion. During its two centuries, the mansion has played host to a large number of U.S. presidents, including Theodore Roosevelt in 1905. Teddy Roosevelt, he was a friend of the Montagues. He came for a visit. Interestingly, during that period, though, governors paid for official entertainment out of their own pockets, which just astonished me when I learned that. And the Montagues were not wealthy, and they couldn't afford to have a dinner party for the president and his wife. So what they did was a compromise. They invited Mrs. Edith Roosevelt to a 
tea, and they invited the president to a luncheon at the Masonic Temple with all the businessmen in town who paid individually for their own meals. But when the president was here, the youngest child, little Janet, must have heard talk about Teddy, Teddy, and the teddy bear was just starting to be popular at that time, named after Teddy Roosevelt. And she came running into the, uh, to see him and, and screaming, Teddy, Teddy, I want Teddy, and <laughs> jumped into his lap. And fortunately, the president was not offended by this because he had little children too, and he calmed her down. Visitors to the mansion run the gamut of American history. From Charles Lindbergh, who visited just five months after his historic flight across the Atlantic, to tennis legend and civil rights activist, Arthur Ashe. I had a lot of dinner fun once for Arthur Ashe. He said, would it be all okay if I brought a couple of family friends? I said, no problem. And so those family friends turned out to be about 15 people. <laughs> so they came to the door. The story really should be told is that the staff had been told that Arthur and I were going to have dinner. When the 15 or so people arrived, they, it, to them, it mattered not. We were having lobster, so we had to make sure we had enough lobster. That was one of those ones where I had the speed bullet and kind of flew out to a connection and got some. It brought back. Stars of the silver screen and television have been made welcome at the mansion as well. Well, we did a great Today Show, if I may be so bold, and we did it from the gate outside, and it was terrific. I mean, it was a fun show, but anyway, of course, it's such a beautiful building, and the Capitol, I think, is spectacular. I was here for Arthur Ashe. I've been here for Nelson Mandela when he went over there. I was here for Rosa Parks. I was here for um, Bill Cosby. It's quite a few. I've been, been around a little bit. James Garner was the only one that I really, really was, was excited about. Me and my dad used to sit and watch his show, so he was the only one that kind of freaked me out. But everybody else was like, no. Because the period decor lends itself to historical films, the mansion has been used as a set for several movies over the years. I got a call from the film office one afternoon that said, we have a very important scouting event coming up. We need you to stay late. We've got a group coming about 7 p.m. So a few of them come and this man comes up and says, hi, I'm Steven. And I said, hi, I'm Sarah, not paying attention to anything. And you could only see about this much of his face because he had a ball cap on and a hoodie on. Um, and about 10 minutes later, I realized that Steven was really Steven Spielberg. One of the most fascinating things that I've been around here for is the filming of the Lincoln movie and just coming into work every day and seeing Steven Spielberg out here and watching him do what he does and that was really fascinating. The house was turned into the White House for the filming of uh, the movie Lincoln with uh, all of those celebrity actors uh, literally right here uh, as uh, hosting a reception for President Lincoln. When they asked my mother and I to be extras, I was beyond thrilled. Being able to be in something with Steven Spielberg and Daniel Day-Lewis, then going and watching it and seeing it, you know, seeing, hey, there's the mansion, there's the couch, you know, there's the Capitol, the buildings, you know, that we've been in. And it was just so neat and talking to everyone here and we're like, yeah, we live here, this is so cool, you know, and getting to just see what goes into it. It was really, really uh, awesome experience. Dedicated employees and volunteers work hard to keep the governor's mansion complex running smoothly. Visitors to the mansion are apt to encounter Tootie Towns, the executive mansion butler, who has been at the mansion for nearly three decades. My dad was here. I say he worked for seven governors, but he worked for one twice, but so it's still seven. So I had, I'm eight. <laughs> and my mom worked here, she was a cook here. My cousin was a um, cook here. I met my wife here, so. You know, it's kind of like a family thing. Well, we basically do everything. <laughs> we do it all. I mean, we'd be able to, um, when the new family comes in, new mansion director comes in, we kind of carry them along to make sure that they know what we're doing and how we do things here. It's pretty much about basic things, how to run parties, how to take care of the family. It's, it's invaluable, that, that knowledge, because when you first start in the house, there's normal questions that you would say, how do I find this, or where would this, and what happens when this, and you're not even thinking, where, where are the Christmas decorations? I mean, I appreciate 2D so much and, and what he's been able to, many mistakes that he's kept us from making. It's fun, it really is, it's fun. I mean, 
you get to meet a lot of different people, you get to meet um, great families most of the time, and things kind of work out to the best when, uh, when things just happen, usually. You kind of get a lot of quirky things to happen, but it's fun. So you just never know what's gonna happen. It's some days you run around in a panic, but then there's other days it's like, yeah, another, another day. Kind of gonna be the same. Mark Herndon came on board as the mansion's first trained chef during the Allard administration. I was the executive chef here from 1995 until 2004. I had only been out of culinary school for two years, worked at a five-star hotel, and then I came here and it was, it was a very exciting time for me. I was 23 when I took the job. It really encompasses everything from the personal meals uh, each and every day to the private functions receptions, dinner parties, business luncheons that they host. So it's, it's a very wide scope. So one day you may be, you know, preparing meals just for the family, lunch, dinner, breakfast. Um, the very next day you may have three events. So it's, it, you know, you really have to be quite flexible and understand that every day is very different. Since 1976, the Virginia State Police have protected the governor and his family. First Sergeant Mark Wiley has worked with four different governors. We travel with the governor and his family if they go down the street to go shopping or if they go halfway around the world, we're, we're with them wherever they go. Whether we try or not, we, we form a bond with the family. You, you can't help but have a personal relationship with the family just because you're around them so much. The mansion and grounds are protected by the Capitol Police, the oldest law enforcement agency in America. We got to be really good friends with the Capitol Police. So because the working at the schools and integrating the schools and all that kind of stuff, we were required by whoever's in charge of the governor to get rides by the Capitol Police. Or I was a cheerleader and the, one of the Capitol Policemen had to come with me uh, for cheerleading nights, football and stuff like that. And um, they, we just got to be such good friends with them. I mean, they just cared so much about whether JFK was gonna win tonight or not, along with the rest of us. 30 years after the mansion was first occupied, the General Assembly authorized the use of convicts in working, repairing, and improving the grounds. Trustees still do work on the property today. Some governor's families have come to know the trustees, as in the case of eight-year-old Nanny, the daughter of Governor Francis Pierpont. She lived here with two brothers right after the Civil War, and that was in the days when there were still prison trustees living on the grounds. And there was one that she liked. She liked the, the convicts. And one she helped escape. He was convict Jack. And when he ran off, the, the prison guard lifted his gun to fire, and Nanny stood in front of the gun. And he got away. And the guard was furious, took her in front of her father, the governor, and, and the governor was furious, and Nanny stood her ground, and she said, I love convict Jack. He gave me this pretty gutta percha ring. I mean, he'd made her some glory. <laughs> so she was quite the uh, young lady. Tour started in 1930 with the butler, Winston Edmonds, who was here for 12 terms with governors. And as they became more popular, when Winston passed away in 1933, First Lady Peary um, formalized the tours. They became so popular that they were originally given by house staff, and they gave it over to volunteers who took over in the 1970s, and now they're led by a team of docents who do a great job. Betty Markham has been a docent for more than 20 years. It's such fun to meet each new family, to see how they like to leave their mark on the mansion, and to see what they like to do to change, because they are, First Lady and the Governor are allowed to change furniture, furnishings, etc. And I never know from one week to the next when I come if, a move, if something's going to be moved, a new picture, new decorations, etc. So it's a thrill for me to be a docent. I think the people that I enjoy the most are the ones who come and they say to you when they get here, I've lived in Virginia all my life and I've never been here. So it's really a, a pleasure to, uh, to be able to take them around the house and have them enjoy being in here. Children of all ages have lived in the mansion. Campbell Grounds became their playground and the house a grand place for a party. 
It was um, the grandest children's party that had ever been held at the governor's mansion on uh, Washington's birthday, 1903, by Governor Montague, who invited 100 children. They came dressed as little Georges or little Marthas in knee breeches or ball gowns and wigs and buckled shoes, and they danced the minuet by candlelight. And Gay Montague remembers telling her mother that she wanted ice cream at that party, ice cream and cake, not in this chicken salad anymore. And so the mansion staff spent days cranking out enough ice cream to feed 100 children. Well, in February, they could store the ice cream containers outside in the in the cold weather there's no refrigeration inside and word got around that some street urchins bad boys who weren't invited to such a party were going to steal the ice cream so the governor put a guard on the ice cream well the guard was distracted and the bad boys made off with all the ice cream except one container and gay montague remembers that as the worst day of her life my um, first use in politics was being the baby that was held up and kissed because I was about uh, 10 months old when he was elected governor. So I was very young you know, during uh, his term, his four years here. But my first memories of this place, this house, were at, starting at about age three or four. We'd arrive on Sunday at uh, close to dark, as I recall, and have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or cornflakes because there was nobody in the whole house, no, no staff. You know, it was just uh, my grandparents and me. So it was, it was uh, a very low-key, you know, approach to life in, in this uh, house. The Holtons brought into the Virginia governor's mansion not only a new 1970s style, a more modern approach to things, they brought four kids. The eldest daughter, Taylor, starting high school. The youngest son, Dwight, grew up as the little, you know, kind of wonderkind running around the Capitol Square. And I remember uh, playing tetherball with him on a cold uh, fall afternoon out behind the governor's mansion, batting the ball back and forth, back and forth. I remember one evening when we had uh, a group from Colonial Williamsburg entertaining in costume. And of course, the children were to be upstairs and left upstairs. But all of a sudden, the audience watching this wonderful performance would see a curtain kind of moving, and then another curtain moving. And finally, somebody said, We've got to find out what that curtain moving is all about. And they opened it, and there was five year old Dwight who had escaped from upstairs, gotten down the stairs, and started sneaking into the room by going for the first curtain and worked his way around the room through the curtains. Ann Holton had the unique experience of living in the mansion as a child and a first lady. We had a great time here uh, as children. What a, a wonderful house to live in. It was kind of like a, you know, a little mini castle to explore as children, and we did explore from the, the tunnels all the way up to the rooftop, and we would go um, traipse around inside and outside the Capitol. There had not been a lot of children at the mansion um, for, for many, many years, and so we were a bit of a shock to the system. The poor Capitol Police, as I say, they weren't used to having kids here, and we kind of made it our business to drive them a little bit crazy um, <laughs> and, um, when we were kids. And, uh, you know, things like the lemonade stand and all of that. I mean, we, we just made the Capitol Square our, our playground, um, and I had told our children all of that and not knowing that they would have the chance to use it back against us. <laughs> so when we came in with them, they kind of expected it to be their playground, and, and it was. Being able to walk in this house every day was, was a good memory in itself. Sometimes I would come and, and sit in, in the parlor here when nobody else is around, and just you kind of look around and you think about the history of this place and what it's been through. And I've gotten to know uh, Governor McDonnell over the last few years, coming to events here. and. You know, I told him one night that um, if there was anything that he could impart to his children, it's to appreciate how special this place is because you don't think you're going to miss it, but you do. One of the wonderful memories that I have with the boys um, was their senior prom. I asked the boys if they'd like to do their prom dinner here, and uh, they thought it was a pretty cool idea. They invited 12 couples. We started with a reception, invited the parents, did the photos inside and outside of the mansion. They looked beautiful. We took a large group shot down in the Gillette Garden. 
once once the, all the photo taking was done, we escorted the parents out, closed the door, and the young people had the mansion. And uh, the governor and I served their dinner. My family, being the jokesters that we are, have been playing many pranks on each other. Um, the, our favorite in general that we play is, um, during the campaign, my dad had a big pop-up cardboard cut out of himself. So we put that all over the mansion and surprised people. We would put it um, in front of your door, so as soon as you open it in the morning, it's there, or down one of the basement, you know, the hallways when it's dark. You turn a corner and you run smack right into Dad. We put it in the elevator, so when you push it, you know, it opens up and there's Dad. And you hear people yelping and screaming, and it's been an ongoing thing for the past three years. We keep coming up with uh, new ways to scare each other. Over the years, governors have brought more than their families with them to Richmond. They've brought their beloved pets as well, ranging from ponies and goats to more traditional pets. We got Bandit in 1979. He was our first dog. Uh, he was about eight years old, and um, he was a beagle, and very uh, loyal and attached, especially to my father, and a friend of my father's in Winchester, who was a home builder, built him a doghouse that was a replica of the state capitol, which we had out in the, in the garden. Uh, we had, Bandit was here with Bilal's, and I think that's my mom's favorite, because uh, he stole her pork chops off the oven, oven door. <laughs> uh, Doris Towns uh, was preparing dinner, and she pulled the pork chops out of the oven, but left them on the rack to cool, and she turned her back, and he just happened to be right, right place, right time, and uh, got himself a pretty good dinner and uh, much to the ire of Doris. He wasn't allowed in the kitchen after that. <laughs> My favorite was was Buster and Bo. That was uh, the Warner's dog. Yeah, because me and Buster would actually run around the table. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. And then uh, the Allens had a cat and his name was Buckwheat. Me and Buckwheat didn't get along too well. Buckwheat used to like to swing on the tablecloth after I set the table and you kind of like try to pull all the dishes off. So me and Buckwheat didn't get along too well. <laughs> the current pet in residence has posed for the cover of Doggy Digest and Family Dog magazines. Her name is Ginger. She's almost 14. We've had her since she was a puppy. She was most excited about this house because we've never had a fenced in yard and she takes control. She gets out the door and she knows where every squirrel in sight is. She loves to visit the uh, Capitol Police at the gate. They always have a, one of her bags of treats out there. That's one of her first stops whenever she goes out the door. Can you, can you sit? Sit, sit. Good girl, good girl. She's also learned how to manage or is very patient with the elevator. We see her from time to time around the house and she'll come in and visit us and it, it, it seems that a lot of times it's around meals that she'll stop in and see what we have to offer. <laughs> Weddings at the mansion are a rare occasion. Throughout its two centuries, the house has witnessed fewer than a dozen weddings and receptions. Governor Wilder's daughter, Lauren, was married in 1993. The wedding actually took place at St. Paul's Church, and the carriage then brought Lauren, my youngest daughter, on up here. And we had our reception here. Uh, it was a very large wedding, as weddings go. It's about 450, I think, guests. And I, one of my favorite parts is that we took a horse-drawn carriage from the church to the uh, mansion after, after the ceremony. So that's very memorable. We've had a lot of different um, milestones for all of the children here. My engagement and then wedding, and when we were first introduced for the first time as husband and wife, we got to walk down the steps into the garden, and that was just you know, a surreal moment to be able to be here and share this house with so many friends and family who would never get to see the mansion otherwise and get to be here and be in it, and it's just a once in a lifetime thing, and I'm so glad. I mean, there's so many great memories and great pictures that we you know, will get to share now because of that. The house has also seen its share of sadness. Reaching back to the Civil War, a funeral train brought the body of General Thomas Stonewall Jackson to Richmond. His black draped casket was brought to the mansion where it remained overnight. Thousands of weeping mourners filed through to pay their respects. 
Likewise, the body of Richmond native Arthur Ashe lay in repose in the mansion after his death in 1993. His wife called me and told me that he wanted to be buried in Virginia. And that's when I ordered the flags at half mast and had his body to lie in state in that same room that we had dinner. That was the first time any person had ever done so, lain in state, since Stonewall Jackson. He laid in state, they had a line that went out of the front gate all the way up to Nye Street, all the way back, all the way around and all the way down to Main Street. That's how long the line was, and it stayed like that for hours. Um, by the time it finished that night, it was like 9.30 that night. The tribute payment is America's oldest ceremony. It comes from a 1677 peace treaty with the Mattapanai and Pamunkey Indian tribes, where the Crown acknowledged wrongs and injuries done to them. Land was reserved for the tribes, and in return they were to pay the royal governor three arrows every year in lieu of taxes. While the details have changed over the centuries, the event still takes place each year. For the past several decades, it has occurred the day before Thanksgiving. They present it uh, as a, a ceremony that has taken place now for these nearly four centuries to pay tribute to the, to the governor uh, and present a donation of game in lieu of taxes as part of their duties under that treaty. So it's, it's ceremonial now, but we, um, and we think this is important. It's a part of what makes us a very diverse and wonderful state. Each family in the mansion has celebrated Christmas in its own way. But one aspect remains constant. Christmas is family time. Christmas Day has traditionally been a private occasion for first families. However, the Christmas season is a very public one with official parties and crowds coming to view the decorations. We spent Christmas every year here during my uh, grandfather's time in office. And there were, by the end of his time, there were 10 grandchildren. So we had great Christmases here and uh, play throughout the, uh, the grounds. One that I recall was getting uh, complete army outfits, head to toe, you know, army outfits for one of my cousins and myself, and he was about a year older. Waking up Christmas morning really made it feel like home. All of us together, you know, being able to wake up in the mansion for, you know, your home, it's Christmas, and uh, getting to share that experience together it made us really all appreciate everything my dad's done, all the sacrifices he's made, and you know, that we get to be together and call it home. It's been a really awesome opportunity. Because the ceilings are 13 foot ceilings, we get to have big trees, the biggest trees I've ever had in my life in a home. It's really special. Every, every first family or every first lady in her Citizens Advisory Council get to make a decision on how to decorate. The first thing I learned coming in was we were going to be hitting the bicentennial. So I really took that opportunity to bring back history. With the extensive renovations in 1999, this house is set to go for decades, uh, maybe 50 years or more. That The building will be housing governors and their families for many, many years to come. It is the people's house. It's an extraordinary a relic that goes back to the uh, foundations of Virginia and the nation. I want as many of our citizens to see it, to feel it, to experience it. It is their house. I'm passing through here for four precious years. And uh, while it's a home, it really belongs to the people. This is the bicentennial for Virginia of the first house. And I'd really, really love to have everyone realize that and recognize that and make time to visit us and come, come see this first house. It's your house. and. We would love to have you as our guest and, and to share this piece of special, rich history with, with all of Virginia. Happy birthday, On this uh, bicentennial anniversary of Virginia Executive Mansion, happy birthday. And thank you so much for all the hospitality and cooperation that you gave us when we made Lincoln and Richmond and at the mansion. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Executive Mansion. I love to wish centenarians a happy 100th birthday. And it's a pleasure to wish the beautiful Virginia Governor's Mansion a happy 200th birthday. I pray it'll be here in 200 more years.